Hi, I'm Amanda P.K. Welcome to this series on Neuroimmunology Nuggets. Neuroimmunology Nuggets is an educational program that was developed with patients in mind to provide a focused or digestible topic uh, in neuroimmunology and autoimmune neurology. For this particular episode, we will be discussing what is autoimmune encephalitis. So first, starting out, what is encephalitis? We need to define that. Encephalitis is inflammation that directly affects the tissue of the brain. This often causes symptoms of memory or cognitive dysfunction, personality change, and sometimes even seizures. When severe, patients are often hospitalized, and sometimes they can have a decreased state uh, of decreased level of consciousness. This inflammation can be caused by different reasons, with the two most common forms of encephalitis from infection or autoimmune disease. In the setting of autoimmune disease, the immune system causes an inflammatory response and the development of autoantibodies that go on and attack your brain. Many different antibodies identified in autoimmune encephalitis and autoimmune neurologic disease can be found. And there's many, many antibodies that are discovered each year, as you can see on this timeline. Sometimes these antibodies serve as biomarkers or signals of the disease, and sometimes they can cause a direct attack on the brain or spinal cord itself. In some cases in which the antibody causes a direct attack on the brain, we call that antibody pathogenic. And the perfect example of this is NMDA receptor encephalitis. In other circumstances, we know the antibody serves as a biomarker or evidence of an autoimmune disease, but the exact mechanism of how the brain inflammation occurs remains unknown. So how do you make a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis? Sometimes we're lucky and we identify a pathogenic antibody, such as an MDA receptor, and this defines and confirms the diagnosis. However, most of the time we don't have a single spinal fluid test or blood test to make the diagnosis, and therefore we rely on the presentation of the patient and a series of tests to make the diagnosis. Here are the clinical criteria for possible autoimmune encephalitis. So diagnosis can be made when all three of the following criteria have been met. This includes subacute onset, meaning the symptoms come on relatively quickly and progress quickly over the course of three months of altered mental status. And this is defined as memory and cognitive issues or personality change. In addition to memory issues, there can be other abnormal findings in one's neurologic exam. So at least one of the following new focal neurologic deficit, seizures, supportive measures such as inflammation on the spinal fluid and MRI findings. So when we talk about a focal neurologic deficit, what is that? Um, so like I said, in addition to memory, there can be other findings on the neurologic exam. And that may include and not limited to walking issues, abnormal involuntary movements, or perhaps visual problems. Um, and like I said, seizures, again, very common. So diagnostic tests that would help define the syndrome include inflammation on the spinal fluid, as seen here on this list, and MRI brain. To meet the criteria, you also need to have reasonable exclusion of alternative causes. So this means that we need to rule out other things that can mimic autoimmune encephalitis, uh, such as infectious causes of encephalitis, and a common one being HSV or herpes simplex virus encephalitis. So this figure here summarizes the workflow for autoimmune encephalitis in terms of looking through these diagnostic features. So when thinking about an autoimmune etiology, it's often suspected based on clinical clues. So 
like I said, the subacute onset where you have um, rapid progression of symptoms over the course of months. This fluctuating course can sometimes be a clue of autoimmune disease, as well as either personal or family history of autoimmunity. We also sometimes look for systemic markers of autoimmunity, even though these are nonspecific blood tests, they can again provide clues. And in the setting of perineoplastic neurologic disease, one may have a history of a cancer. And so working through this diagram here, uh, we often start with spinal fluid studies, again, looking for any evidence of inflammation. We start with some blood tests, again, looking for any nonspecific markers of inflammation. An EEG can sometimes be helpful. What this is, this is a test uh, to look for any underlying seizures. And again, your MRI of the brain, looking for any signs of encephalitis, often affecting what we call the mesiotemporal lobe, uh, which is a part of your limbic system. And so if your spinal fluid studies or your serum studies show evidence of inflammation, we move on very quickly to look for um, specific autoantibodies, both in the spinal fluid and in the blood. Uh, again, if your EEG shows these abnormalities, that can help you. If the MRI is normal, which you know happens a, a decent percentage of the time, Sometimes in certain circumstances, further imaging with a brain PET scan can be helpful. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, if we do find a particular antibody, there are clear associations between certain antibodies and certain cancers. So we help, the, the antibody helps us with what needs to be done in terms of looking for that cancer or doing your malignancy screen. I'm going to revisit this slide, emphasizing again, there are many antibodies identified in autoimmune encephalitis. Notably, not all of these antibodies are commercially available for testing, as noted here with the asterisk. And therefore, some have yet to be discovered, and we, this can certainly have an impact on what we find on the diagnostic testing. If it's an antibody we're not aware of, or it's not commercially available, there is a high potential for, for missing it when we do the diagnostic workup. So when considering antibody testing, it's important to keep these facts in mind. Like I said, antibodies are discovered every year and we continue to learn more in this field. Uh, it's also important when we, when we test these antibodies, in some cases, these antibodies are biomarkers of the disease and can sometimes be markers of an underlying cancer. So we have to do the appropriate workup. And just because you don't find an antibody doesn't mean it can't be autoimmune encephalitis. And in certain clinical scenarios, treatments and cancer screening should still be considered. So. As we start coming to the end of this episode of Neurology Nuggets, I wanna leave you with a patient's story of DPPX associated autoimmune encephalitis. So this is a story of a 77 year old man who developed memory and cognitive symptoms. And eventually this led to abnormal involuntary movements of the mouth and the tongue. He was evaluated at six months after the onset of these symptoms and he was found to have something we call bradykinesia, and what these are are slowed movements, um, as well as a tremor and oral buccal dyskinesias, or these abnormal mouth movements on his exam. Other notable symptoms uh, as part of his course was a very profound 50 pound weight loss um, over the course of 11 months. And after the onset of his symptoms, by 11 months, he had progression and functional decline until he was essentially bedridden. I wanna thank um, our patients for letting us show this video and as well to our Movement Disorder Fellow for recording these videos. Here is a uh, video of the patient at seven months and at 11 months. Can you repeat after me, Methodist Episcopal. And West Register Street. West. West. 
And I'm just going to pause there. I want you to note the mouth movements with him sticking out his tongue. He was unable to control that. Uh, his voice is somewhat slurred and quiet. Face each other. Yep. And hold it like that. Good. And thumbs down, backs to each other, both sides. And show me big taps. Just with the first finger and the thumb. Big and fast. As fast as you can. Keep going. No. Good. Now the other side. Okay. Side. Show me how to hammer a nail. Yeah. Okay. Push up on the chair. Push up on the yeah. Oops. Okay, it's time. Show me how to hammer a nail. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Push up on the chair. Push up on the, yeah, the arms of the chair. Yeah. Good. Take your time. Are you dizzy? Okay, come on back. Can you do this? So you can see in the second half of this video, um, he had a difficult time following those commands. His movements were much more slowed. Um, and at this point, uh, he was admitted to the hospital. I'm going to then show you this video here where he is now on the pathway to recovery. Uh, after um, he was in the hospital, he was found to have uh, this particular antibody, DPPX antibody, in his spinal fluid, diagnostic of antibody mediated encephalitis. He was treated with acute therapies, including. Uh, plasma exchange and steroids while in the hospital, and then quickly started on additional immune therapy with rituximab. The Ashford's Medical Center. Uh -huh. uh, to see uh, the progress that I've made. That's Can you use your right hand, touch your left ear, and then stick out your tongue? The next finger doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Great. Right. Awesome. Great. Right. Uh -huh. And do it bigger. And how about on this side? Correct. Okay. And then can you open and close your fists? Okay. And then put your arms out in front of you like this. Okay. And then put it in front of you like this. Okay. And now we're going to do some tapping on like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we're going to do the You could see he could stand up much easier.
can turn around. You can turn around. So I hope you can appreciate in this video, um, he, well, he still has some very mild uh, movements of his tongue. These are significantly improved and continued to improve following this nine month uh, follow-up video. Uh, he is able to stand up from the chair, walk a lot easier. We don't see these slow movements and his comprehension is significantly better. So recognition of this rare antibody and treatment with immune therapy, in this patient's case for Tuximab, has restored much of his neurologic function. Uh, we were following cognitive testing as part of his follow-up in clinic, and you can see the numbers here. We use something called a, a MOCA or Montreal Cognitive Assessment. When he was in the hospital, he was unable to complete it, and his numbers have steadily increased over time uh, and to this day continue to improve beyond 18 out of 30 um, with a normal value being above 27. Uh, again, his clinical exam gets better, as you could see in the video. He is doing remarkably well. He's living at home. He's participating in all of his activities of daily living. Um, and, and he has done extraordinarily well with this disease. Um, now, sometimes, especially depending on the antibody, immune therapy may only stop the progression of the disease. But for some antibody-mediated encephalitides, such as this case, we can see these significant improvements in this devastating disease. Just a little bit of background on DPPX associated autoimmune encephalitis. DPPX is a very rare antibody that can cause encephalitis, often comes along with other symptoms such as this profound weight loss, sometimes accompanied by diarrhea, and it can have a very protracted course and, and often represent a neuro, or resemble a neurodegenerative disease. Um, and part of that is because, uh, again, it has this protracted course and a slower disease progression. In this particular study um, the, or case series, the disease progression was over the course of eight months, as well as affecting a bit older of a population with a median age of 57 in this particular series, again, shown here. So just to keep in mind, autoimmune encephalitis can look very different between individuals and comes in many different flavors, shapes, and sizes. It can affect small kids to the elderly, both men and women. While each individual antibody may be rare, when you look at the antibodies altogether, it's more common than you think. With essentially one in 100,000 people affected each year, and basically that's 4,000 people in the United States each year. So thank you for tuning into this episode of Neuroimmunology Nuggets. There is more to come in other episodes on specific antibodies that cause autoimmune encephalitis. Thank you again.